Understanding what creatine really is and understanding the different kinds of creatines that are out there and all kinds of products really comes down to having a solid understanding of how creatine is created in the body in the first place and what it actually does. So in this video, I'm not only going to break down the different kinds of creatines so that you can address exactly what is on the label of your favorite products, but I also want you to be able to have a solid understanding of literally the physiology behind creatine in our bodies, but also what it's doing at a cellular level. All right, so let's start with, generally speaking, what is creatine? So creatine is something that's created by the body to ultimately start carrying energy and allow the transfer of energy to occur from the mitochondria, basically throughout the rest of the cell. What that ultimately means is that creatine is formed by three different amino acids that are non-essential in the liver and the kidneys, okay? We've got arginine, we've got glycine, and we've got methionine. These three amino acids combined create this wonderful thing known as creatine. So right then and there, we have to address that creatine is not this unsafe thing, it's naturally occurring in the bodies, and our bodies typically know how to get rid of excess amounts of it. So what we also have to know is that creatine is predominantly stored in the skeletal muscle tissue. That's why it has such a big role when it comes down to athletes, when it comes down to strength training. In fact, we end up holding about three and a half grams of creatine in every pound of our skeletal muscle tissue. And we have the capability to hold up to about five grams per pound of skeletal muscle tissue. So by and large, it's happening right at the source of the muscle. Okay, so now we have to understand what is going on when this creatine actually creates energy. If we understand the simple method that really goes behind it, it makes everything that much more clear. You see, it starts in the mitochondria. The mitochondria is the energy powerhouse of a cell. Okay, plain and simple. The mitochondria is what takes ketone bodies, fatty acids, glucose, and converts them into adenosine trisphosphate. Fancy, complex way of saying, takes the food that you eat and turns it into energy. It all happens at the mitochondria. But creatine is behind a lot of the activity there. You see, our mitochondria don't really do much until we're active. If a muscle cell is dormant or we're not moving, the mitochondria isn't really firing and creatine isn't really working with it. But as soon as activity starts, something pretty cool happens. Remember that creatine we talked about, the creatine that was made by the liver and kidneys, this natural organic compound that's floating around through our bodies? Well, it travels over to that mitochondria, okay, the energy powerhouse of the cell, and it goes to that adenosine trisphosphate, and it steals a phosphate molecule from that. Okay, adenosine triphosphate means adenosine with three phosphate molecules. Creatine comes in and it takes one of those phosphate molecules away, just rips it away, kidnaps it. So now you're left with adenosine disphosphate. So now you have adenosine and two phosphate molecules, but the creatine stole one of the phosphate molecules, now becoming creatine phosphate. So this creatine phosphate is the magical carrier. It is this creatine phosphate system that allows our body to produce energy and to have the strength that we want in the gym or when we're sprinting. So then, this creatine phosphate travels to another area of the cell where the actual cell creates more work and actually creates output, and it drops off that phosphate molecule. It's like it gave it a bus ride to a different area of the cell. And it combines with ADP again to make ATP again. So you see the cycle? It goes from ATP to ADP back to ATP. Well, where does energy come into this equation? Energy is actually created when the creatine steals the phosphate molecule. It's the separation of this bond, it's the separation of this happy marriage that creates energy. I want you to think of it like a happy couple that's just going through life and totally harmonious, and then all of a sudden, someone else comes into the picture and rips a person away. Suddenly, there's fire, suddenly there's energy. That's exactly what's happening at the cellular level when the creatine phosphate system is in action. That's how you create energy, and that's how it's restored. Okay. Simple science. Now let's get down to the different kinds of creatine that are out there because I think it's important that you know exactly what they're doing in your body so that you can save money, to be completely honest. Let's start with the main one, creatine monohydrate. It's the most basic creatine that's out there and it's 90% creatine and about 10% water. And it's probably the main component of a lot of creatine supplements that you're used to seeing. Now, it's been shown that simple creatine monohydrate does dramatically improve strength. In fact, on average, it improves it by about 10%. Yeah, it's gonna range anywhere from five to 8%, a lot of times depending on whether it's upper body or lower body or how much uh, actual muscle tissue you have or the power of the sarcoplasm in that general area, just a lot of different variables. But by and large, creatine monohydrate is very powerful at helping improve strength. 
Okay, then there's other versions of it. Okay, there's micronized versions of creatine monohydrate. Micronized versions of creatine monohydrate are really just instantized forms where the creatine monohydrate is broken down into smaller particles, so it presumably can be absorbed more. But there's not a whole lot of science showing whether or not micronized creatine really does a whole lot. Okay, so let's talk about the next kind of creatine that you probably see a lot of, and that's buffered creatine or chelated creatine. Now the whole idea behind chelated creatine or buffered creatine is just to add an alkaline component to it. Essentially what we find a lot of times is that the stomach is a very acidic, harsh environment, which means that in theory, creatine wouldn't be able to really survive very well when it's taken orally. So if you attach some kind of alkaline component to it, basically in this case magnesium, you're making it a lot easier for the body to handle it. Now in theory, again, that makes sense, but there's some science that says otherwise. There was a study that was published in the journal of the International Society of Sports Nutrition that took a look at participants, particularly male ones, that were going to take a creatine supplement. They had them take creatine monohydrate or they had them take buffered creatine. Well, by and large, what they found was that, yeah, both groups saw an improvement in their strength, they saw an improvement in their power, but there was no difference in strength or power between the monohydrate group and the buffered creatine group. Okay. Then there was another study that was published by the Strength and Conditioning Journal that also found very, very similar results. In this case, they took a look at chelated creatine versus creatine monohydrate. And they still found in this case that there was very little difference in which one was better. At the end of the day, both parties ended up finding that they had more strength and more power. Creatine is creatine, plain and simple when it comes to this. All right, now that leads us into the next one, which is esterized creatine. You might see this on the back of your label when it says creatine ethyl ester, or CEE. All that an ethyl ester is, is an esterized form of creatine. And what that simply means is that there is an ester attached. An ester is generated from organic compounds, usually combining carboxylic acid and a different kind of alcohol to actually form what is known as an ester which is basically making something a little bit more fat soluble. You see, creatine is what is known as hydrophilic. Hydrophilic means that it likes to bind with water, but it is also semi-lipophilic, which means it does kinda sorta like to bind to fats every now and then, but it's not very efficient at it. So the whole idea behind creatine ethyl ester is actually quite you know, sensible. Basically what it means is you're taking an ethyl ester and attaching it to creatine to try to improve the absorbability of it by also trying to help it be absorbed through fats. So in theory, you would get the absorption that naturally occurs through water, but then by adding this ester group, you're also improving the absorption through fats. So plain and simple, right? Except Baylor University actually did a study and took a look at this where they took an ethyl ester group, they took a monohydrate group, and they took a placebo group, and they ultimately found that both the monohydrate and the ethyl ester groups did have improvements in strength and power, however, it took 20 days for the creatine to actually take effect in the ester group, whereas it only took five to six days for the monohydrate to take effect. That's pretty darn amazing. Now they also found that there were significant increases in the amounts of what is known as creatinine in the blood. Now creatinine is a useless byproduct of creatine that is actually toxic and can be quite damaging to our kidneys, so we really don't want that. So ethyl ester is kind of a no-go in my book. Okay, then we have liquid creatines. We're talking about like the ready to drink things and all that stuff. I'm gonna keep this one short. Stay away from those. It's not gonna do you any good. Creatine, once it is suspended in water, loses its effectiveness. In fact, once it's suspended, it starts to break down and turn into that creatinine that I said was not good. So we don't need the liquid version. Let's just stay away from it. Next, we have creatine hydrochloride. Now, all creatine hydrochloride is, is a creatine molecule combined with hydrochloric acid. Basically what we're doing here is trying to make it so that it's a nice, even, happy marriage in the gut, creating aqueous solution that allows the creatine to absorb right into the intestinal tract and never have an issue. The thing is, it's too new. We don't have a lot of science, at least in human studies, to show whether or not it's effective. And it's also quite pricey. So at the end of the day, I guess I'm not trying to say all these things are bad. I'm just saying creatine monohydrate is the simplest, most basic, and most well-researched form. And all these other different variations of creatine are just different variations of creatine monohydrate with other things attached. So why would you pay more money to have a more complex model when the simplest thing is just a commodity that's right there in front of you? So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. And if you have any ideas for future videos, make sure you let me know in the comment section below, and I will see you soon.